دع الأيام تفعل ما تشاء وطب نفسا إذا حكم القضاء ولا تجزع لحادثة الليالي فما لحوادث الدنيا بقاء Assalamu alaikum and welcome to today's unscripted podcast. Over the last few years, uh, more and more people in the English speaking world have been alerted to the oppression faced by our Uyghur brothers and sisters in East Turkestan, which is under Chinese occupation. We've seen more and more horrendous news coming out from uh, about concentration camps, atheism, indoctrination centers, rape and sexual violence, torture, forced labor, and even subhanallah, organ harvesting. This week on Islam 21C, we're exploring the theme of Uyghurs in more detail. And we're very glad to have two special guests to enlighten us on this topic. Arsalan Hadayat, he's the founder of the largest media platform in the English language, specializing in Uyghur affairs, TET, Talk to East Turkestan. Assalamu alaikum, Arsalan. Wa alaikum assalam, brother. If I may, I just want to correct you just there. Okay. Um, so, the, so the biggest channel uh, talking about the Uyghurs' plight in the English language. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, talk to you, Sir Kassan, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, we have, obviously, Sheikh Dr. Yas Al-Qadi. There's no introduction. He's the, um, the Dean of Academic Affairs in the Islamic Seminary of America at the moment. And he's visited the region and spoken and written about this. Uh, topic uh, extensively. Zakum al-Khair, Sheikh, for uh, joining us. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. It's always a pleasure anytime and especially for the uh, Uyghur cause. Um, anytime, whatever little we can do, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So I wanted um, uh, us just to uh, discuss this issue in more detail because, um, I mean, Arsalan, you can enlighten us on maybe the history of what's actually going on. Um, Sheikh, you've sp- spoken about the history of Islam, how did Islam even get into China or that, that region in the first place? Um, so, Arsalan, just kick us off with a brief kind of um, a history of the modern period because I've I've spoken to, I've met some Uyghur brothers and sisters and they surprised me and they told me an interesting statistic that, uh, an interesting, interesting fact that um, East Turkestan was actually the first uh, Islamic republic in the world, even before uh, Pakistan. So, what's the what's the modern history behind this region, and uh, so we can get a bit of a context. Yeah. So, if we want to go back to again, yes, well, uh, we say that uh, before the Ottomans, before the Seljuks, uh, before the um, our brothers in Pakistan, uh, the Uyghurs were the first uh, Turkic Islamic uh, nation uh, during the Karakhan period, which was led by uh, Sultan Satpurahan in 934 so early 10th century oh, okay. um and we are very proud of this but in right now um you know every day we see that islam is uh, disappearing so uh once islam does enter into the region or enter east turkestan um you know hundreds of years of dawa uh i guess jihad various turkic states uh are formed uh, but we get to a very interesting point in time when we hit about 1759, mm. which is when the Sayyid Kingdom, uh, an Uyghur Kingdom in East Turkestan, also known as the Yarkand Kingdom, is invaded by the Manchu Empire uh, in 1759. And we are annexed and we become part of the uh, Manchu Empire. Obviously, there is a lot of revolting uh, by the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims uh, for the next hundred or so years. And in, 80s, in 1862, we do have a brief period of uh, freedom. And, uh, but that's, and during that brief time of freedom, we actually give bayah to the Ottoman Empire for a brief, brief hmm. period. But that's, that doesn't last very long. And in uh, 1884, they annex the Manchus annex us once more. And we are officially given the name uh, Xinjiang which is what we know now today, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, but Xinjiang, the Uyghur Autonomous Region comes in later. So Xinjiang is given literally meaning new territory in 1884. Mm. Uh, not long after that, the Manchu Empire is overthrown by the Chinese nationalists in 1911. About 20 years later, in 1933, uh, the Uyghurs are able to establish the East Turkestan Islamic Republic in the city of Kashgar. 
which uh, borders with Afghanistan, uh, mm. but that is short lived. And then for the next 10 years or so, we are trying to gain our independence once more from the, um, from the Chinese nationalists. And in 1944, with the help of the Soviet Union, we have a second East Turkestan Republic established towards the north of East Turkestan in the city of Ulja, um, which borders with Russia. It's towards the north. And that's, that goes for about five years. And uh, historically and, popu and popularly, in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party comes into play and um, they take over the region, uh, promising us to unite against the, the nationalists. And um, because during that time, the common enemy between the Chinese communists and the Uyghurs were the nationalists. So there was mm -hmm. big propaganda going on. And in, <clears throat> finally, in 1955, so that the Uyghurs do not revolt against any sort of Chinese empire, any party, any government once more, they give us the name Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, by name autonomous, but in no way are we autonomous. We don't vote for our own leaders um, and things like this. And at the beginning, you know, it, it, it seems okay, but then we go through various stages of oppression. So one, uh, you know, you may know that the Uyghurs, we write in an Arabic script. Mm. So our, our language is Turkic based, but we write in an Arabic script. So that's, that's changed into Latin immediately. Um, just like kind of what Ataturk did during yeah, the, yeah. when he, you know, uh, first established the Turkish Republic. So people like in my mother's generation, um, you know, cannot read or well, they can read, but they are not very fluent in the Arabic script. Yeah. Whereas a generation after that, they are in the Arabic script. So from 62 to 82, they have Latin script. And in 1982, they go back to the Arabic script. So you have a few generations where people are illiterate. And during this time, you have the elites of the society being culled. Uh, they are made out to be monsters. Um, mm. a, a lot of our elite were educated in Russia and, uh, or overseas, and uh, they are demonized. And, you know, during communism and especially during the Cultural Revolution, the rich people were demonized. And, um, you know, the, the laymen or the people are forced to not forced, but uh, they, are, they are indoctrinated to revolt against these people and saying that they are unhappy in this way. I mean, there are brief times of freedom, but what, what seems to happen is every 10 years or so, there is a slaughtering or culling of people. And I liken this to a, a Hollywood movie that I saw a few years ago called Snowpiercer, where you have the, the, the last remaining population of the Earth on the train. And every 10, 20 years or so, because the population in the train gets so large, they start to cull the last... Uh, cabin. Um, and so we have this, so at around 1980, the China, China introduces the one child policy to the majority Chinese Han population and the mm -hmm. two child policy to the rest of the minorities. Uh, these are Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Mongols, Kyrgyz, everybody else. But the Uyghurs revolt against this in 1991, sorry, in 1990. And uh, we have the Baden massacre where thousands are killed because they wanted to, I mean, as Turkic people, as Arab people, as Muslims, you know, we generally have a lot of children, four, mm. five, six children. And um, so right on the spot, we, uh, in China's abortion policies, it doesn't matter where you are in your pregnancy, six, seven, eight, nine months, they will abort the child no matter what. And the ones that do survive, uh, the families are made to pay hefty fines if they not pay them. They are, you know, forced to go to prison and spend some time there for having a third child. Um, and then in 1997, we have a Wulja massacre. Wulja massacre was based on religious freedoms where, where women were not allowed to wear hijab or the men without beads. Um, and so there was a large mass massacre in 1997, February the 5th, 1997. And we commemorate that every year. 12 years later, we have the famous Urumqi massacre. Um, that was based on... We've heard of Chinese labor being cheap, but Uyghur labor mm. is much more cheap. Uh, and so Uyghur people are sent into the inner parts of China to work in factories to make our iPhones, our toys, our, our technology. And the Chinese factory workers, um, you know, disgruntled, perhaps they were la laid off. There, 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 there are many reasons on how this started. Uh, a lot of our youth were, were culled by si literally citizens uh, or disgruntled workers. Mm. And we estimate during that time, uh, anywhere between 500 to 1,000 out of our youth factory workers within inner China mm. had died. And then there was a protest 10 days later in Urumqi, the capital of East Turkestan, where tens of thousands of youth went missing. And now we come to 
uh, this day and age where we where we see the concentration camps, literally modern day concentration camps, mm -hmm. we are liken them to uh, literally just a level under what happened uh, to the Jews 75 years ago, um, where, as you've mentioned, uh, forced sterilization, forced marriages, um, you know, uh, banning of Islam. We've seen you've seen the images of mosques being destroyed, names illegal, names like Muhammad, Mehmet, uh, you know, um, uh, Fatima, Aisha. Uh, I even heard of a atheist indoctrination centers. Where... Yes. So, so in these concentration camps, there are four levels of these mm -hmm. concentration camps. The first level is like going to school. Literally, what they say, like going to school, like nine to five indoctrination. Mm -hmm. You go there nine to five and you come back. The second one is the one you, where you actually stay, the, the infamous concentration camps, where you are indoctrinated, you are on, based on the, the former concentration camps detainees that I mm -hmm. was able to interview and talk to, telling me they, that they were receiving anywhere between four to 500 calories a day. They would receive a steamed, mm -hmm. uh, a steamed bun and some sort of soupy liquid, which was what they were given, interrogation sessions going anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So you have sleep deprivation, food deprivation, um, uh, torture. So, for example, I was talking to a woman by the name of Zumrat Tawut, and um, she had some food, and she noticed that a much older lady was, you know, she needed the food, and she gave the food to this much older lady, and the guard saw her, and she received a beating. Mm -hmm. And in that beating, um, you know, inside our fitra, or the inclination is to say, oh God, or oh Allah. And because she said that, ah, you have some deen in you. And so mm -hmm. she was beaten further. So in these indoctrination, in these concentration camps, any sort of Uyghurness or Turkness or Islam is sort of pulled out of you. So you become, uh, what's, what's the word, like assimilated with the rest of China. So a lot of people ask, why do the Chinese do this? Is because the Uyghurs are not assimilated enough. And what I mean by assimilation is it's, it's not that they, they're not, what, like they're technically, according enough. So... What I like to give is an example, like we all live in the West, yeah? So I'm an Australian citizen. I live in Australia. But for example, as Australians, Australians usually, what uh, it's famous, like they'll go to the beach, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they'll free mix and they'll go into the water or they'll have a beer on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And so the sort of the stereotypical things an Australian would do, I do not do, right? But the Australian government is not going to punish me for being stereotypically un-Australian. You know what I mean? So the Chinese, for the Chinese, the, the Uyghurs being Muslim, practicing having a bead, having a hijab, mm. or talking the Uyghur language, not wanting to marry with Chinese people, these, all these things that we see as normal every day, like the British Muslims do this on a daily basis, American Muslims do this mm. on a daily, you guys have lived this, um, is seen as separatism, extremism, and, um, and they believe that this leads to terrorism. So in a nutshell, this is why we are being attacked. It's not purely a war against Islam because we know that the Hui Muslims have been living quite freely. There are some areas like uh, cities like Landru and Ningxia and mm. Xining. There are these places where, you, honestly, if you went to these places, I mean, uh, I'm sure the Sheikh will agree. Some of these places are like Saudi Arabia, women in niqab, madrasas, Quran and all this. But even they, for the past two or three years, have been suffering, not to the level of the Uyghurs, mm. but they are, they are suffering as well. Assalamualaikum guys, sorry to butt in, eh? but if you're enjoying this podcast, please head over to islamtunancy.com forward slash donate to help us make more. And if you're not enjoying it, head over anyway and help us make better ones. I do want to get into the uh, a bit of the, the kind of why the Chinese state is doing this. But Sheikh Yasser, you're nodding your head, you've, you've risen to the region. Does that chime with your experiences there? Firstly, a clarification. Um... This my visit actually caused uh, some eyes being raised, which I fully understand. So I visited um, three years ago, I think. And uh, because I went through a travel agency, our bookings had already been done 10 months in advance. So when mm -hmm. the trip was announced and everything was was basically set in stone, there was no whiff of what's going on with the Uyghur community. Uh, by the time the trip's coming closer and closer, the news is coming out that something is happening, but we're not quite sure, you know, it wasn't fully there. And so there was a point, should we go, should we not go? And I decided, you know, the only reason I would be able to go is if I try my best to at least meet as many Chinese Muslims and get as much information as I can from within. This was, again, way before the news had come in public. It's only amongst yeah. the Muslims, you know, whisperings, whatnot going on. And so had I known of the realities, and obviously I do not encourage 
going as a tourist to China right now, uh, mm -hmm. even if there's no COVID, because obviously uh, we are indirectly supporting a regime that is doing uh, horrendous things. But my only excuse was this was before the news had gone public. And then after I came back, I gave a very uh, well-received lecture, which Alhamdulillah was viewed by, uh, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000 people, where I went over the, the history of Islam in China. And I went over some of the repressions that even the Hui and the others are undergoing. Mm. Uh, our group was not allowed to go to uh, the Xinjiang province. And uh, even as our group uh, went, it was being monitored and followed wherever we went. We could see the secret police. They weren't that secret. We could see them in the hotel lobbies with us. We could see them following us around just because we were a large group of Western Muslims, just because of that. And we interviewed um, the local uh, Chinese uh, Muslims uh, living in uh, the, the, the major cities. And honestly, it was very sad for me to see uh, the level of state control and the level of knowledge as well that they had, which was very dismal. It wasn't their fault. Obviously, it's not their fault that they're that way. Uh, I did not meet a single uh, imam or sheikh that had been trained within China that could carry uh, a simple conversation in Arabic. They understood my Arabic, mm. but they could not reply back. So this was like, to me, the equivalent of a first year Arabic learning in Medina, for example, like your Arabic, not even the, in the college, but the Arabic lang language program. I'm sure they studied some basic fiqh, but their Quranic recitation was, mm. you know, a lot to be said about. And these were their trained imams. And I asked around surreptitiously, where are the Medina grads? Because when I was in Medina, uh, there were hundreds of Chinese students, hundreds. Again, this is in the mid 90s, right? And apparently, if you graduated from those foreign universities, you have no opportunity to become a sheikh or an alim. You have to just go and get a menial job or whatever. And so the people giving da'wah are basically under state control. I asked the, the imam of um, uh, one of the masajid there that, you know, are you allowed to preach, you know, Islam and whatnot? And he phrased it in a very nice way. He said, we have full freedom to say whatever we want to whoever comes to us in the masjid. Okay. So they're not even allowed to talk about Islam outside of the masjid. You know, so their level of Islam is... is mm. A lot to be said, you know, in that regard. Um, but I have a question for you, Arsalan, is that um, you're saying you're Australian. So you're, you're born and raised in Australia? Born and raised in Australia, yes. Okay, so your parents grew up in, uh, uh, in the Uyghur province. Yes, my parents grew up in the Uyghur province and they left right after the Cultural Revolution. Um, I was lucky enough to go to the region, I guess, 10, 10, 12 times. And each time I went, I would spend at least half a year five, six months. So, okay. um, yeah. so when your parents grew up, I'm assuming this is the 70s and 80s era, yes. they relatively had far more freedoms uh, than anything we're seeing now. Is that correct? Um, so the Cultural Revolution ended uh, towards the late 70s. And so, so they were going through the Cultural Revolution. So they were going through oppression at that time as well. So but, but, but the, from what I'm hearing from the Uyghurs that lived during the 80s, they relatively had freedom. Like they would have the Quran under their armpit. They would be able to carry it around. So my parents left in like 1980 before, before they saw any of this freedom. Mm. Um, so, so there would be a softening of policies and then a hardening of policies. Mm. So for, I'll give you an example. Uh, Uyghurs uh, used to be able to go to Hajj on tightly controlled groups. But later on, you know, with a Chinese passport legally, but later on, those same people are now in concentration camps saying, why did you go to Hajj for? Mm. Hold on, didn't you let me go? I'm on a Chinese passport. Or people simply going to Egypt, uh, uh, you know, uh, enrolling in Al-Azhar or going yeah. to Turkey or going to America. So even legal means, so th th they let you go, th they soften the policies, and then they round you up again. Mm. Um, so, so, so they've used this sort of policy for, for many, many years. So the question that a lot of us have is what exactly happened in the last 15 years that exacerbated the situation to this level? Did the Chinese administration start issuing further restrictions? And if they did, then what was the, you know, what was the reason for this? Like the, the Chinese government, again, so I'm an outsider, obviously, to the entire region. What I saw from them was bureaucratic efficiency. Heartless bureaucratic efficiency. Mm -hmm. From their perspective, the way I see it, they don't want to annihilate the Uyghurs. They need that province to have human beings in them. And so, as you yourself are saying, the softening and the hardening of policies, they clearly want 
people to be able to, you know, be farmers and, and work the land and there are minerals there. They need that. They clearly don't want to annihilate it. Like you said, it's one notch below the concentration camps of Germany because the goal of Germany was to kill everybody. But the goal of, of these concentration camps is to produce factory workers for the bureaucratic administration. So what exactly prompted the government to go down this route that they know there's going to be a backlash? I don't think they're that naive to not understand that. So that's the question I have for you. So the Uyghurs, ever since its occupation, and we see it as an occupation, um, we have been an underlying problem for the Chinese regime for since 1949. They have been looking at ways to annihilate us. When it comes to manpower, we'll get to the manpower. But the global war on terror in 2001 mm -hmm. was the perfect excuse mm -hmm. when George Bush said, you know, you're either with us, us or them. Uh, China said, you know what, we have Muslims within our borders. So they used that, they used, uh, that as a cover to also um, uh, punish the Uyghurs. So since 2001, they have ramped up what we call synthesizing or assimilating. So first they mm -hmm. did it softly. They would go to say the, the families softly and go, you know what? We think your child would do better if they went into the inner lands. So first they did surveys. They took it slowly and slowly. They would offer people money to, to intermarry with Chinese people. And slowly, slowly they harden their policies. So one, they actually do not need Uyghur people at all because the Chinese people migrate to East Turkestan every year in their hundreds of thousands and they are given the jobs, they are given the homes, they're given the education. The difference between the Germans and the Chinese, the Chinese are actually smarter because they have the because they have the money and the technology and the capability to profit off the backs of Muslims. Mm -hmm. So just like uh, the people that live in the wild, you know us when, when we want to eat a cow, We only want the best pieces of steak. We want the ribeye. We want that. And we throw away the rest. But people in the wild, they'll, they'll use every part of the animal. So what I meant to say is the Uyghurs from their hair. Their hair right now is 100. Um, uh, I forget the statistics now, but it's a multi-billion dollar in industry mm. right now because the women's hair I mean, you know, like, uh, obviously, you know, as Muslims, women are not allowed to show their hair, but culturally wise, symbolically, the Uyghur's uh, hair means certain things like various knots, the, the women's hair I'm talking about. Uh, it, it, it indicates whether they're single or not and has various different meanings, what province they're from and whatnot. So in the camps, the, the Chinese are profiting from their hair. Number two, they're profiting from their labor. Uh, we know from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute that 83 global brands, including Apple, Samsung, uh, H&M, and all these big brands that we know um, are directly or indirectly involved. And this has been proven. So they profit off the labor. They profit of what we call halal organ harvesting. Now, obviously, Sheikh, um, you, you, you know your fiqh, there's no such thing as halal organs. But uh, this, is what, this, this, is, this term has been coined because many people in the, in the Gulf area opt and there are many many um commercials and hospital ads uh on youtube you can find and i'll send you those links uh where you will actually see muslim canteens and mess massage in where where hospitals are being destroyed you've got these hospitals so to you, cater cut, for you cut out there the for a second you're saying that you you find muslim massage on hospitals in hospitals yeah. in the inner parts of china specifically to cater for those rich arab uh Uh, the, the people in the Gulf that go and get their halal organs because apparently mm -hmm. what they're asking for is they want organs from Muslims. They don't want organs from people that have you know, consumed alcohol and pork. And they have a database. Speaking to a few concentration camp detainees, what they've told me is the first thing that the Chinese, do, uh, the, the authorities do is before they even go to the camps, they check their eyes. They, they take their blood on a daily, uh, on a daily basis. Um, they are given injections. So they are put into this database and they have all of these records of these people and these people are ready to go. You know, 30-day money-back guarantee. If this, that organ doesn't work, so there is this going on and you can simply type in halal organ harvesting. You can mm. see the many interviews. You, you can see the, the testimony that former Uyghur surgeons who literally, uh, we have one surgeon by the name of Anmar Tohti who currently resides in London. Uh, he basically said, Um, they they half they went to execute 
uh, a Uyghur prisoner and they purposely shot him in the shoulder. And while he was alive, he was forced to extract uh, the man's organs while he was still breathing. And, and now the Chinese in general and, 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 and the Muslims of the area, the, and even according to Chinese statistics, the number of people volunteering to, to give their organs is very, 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 very low. However, in East Turkestan, the least populous region in China, even though it's the largest, you have express transfer lanes and all the images you can see on, um, uh, on the internet, express transfer lanes in airports where it says for organs to go through quickly. Now, this must mean God knows how many organs uh, are being harvested for you to have express transfer lanes put into airports. So wait, Arsalan, just to be clear here, obviously yeah. from a fiqh perspective, if a person voluntarily, willingly wants yeah. to donate his organ to another human being, his yeah. brother or sister, this is halal. But the minute money comes involved, right, obviously it becomes haram. You're not allowed to sell your organs. But in this case, so that our viewers understand, this is not even a person very desperate wanting $10,000 for a kidney and then selling it on the black market. That is haram. This is to a level that is depraved. This is the government taking over. This is the government removing any notion of volunteering, any notion of it's the government mm -hmm. profiteering. It's not even the money isn't even going to, uh, even though it would be haram anyway. But, you know, we understand a person is forced by circumstance to do that. It's not an excuse, but we understand psychologically. But in this case, as our viewers, you know, need to be aware, the government has basically used uh, our brothers and sisters to be uh, breeders of just organs to sell them to the highest bidder. And then the issue comes, Arsan, you just, you just uh, mentioned that they, they needed to execute a prisoner. But see, here's the conundrum. When the money is coming in to that level, they're going to find more and more prisoners to execute, if you get my point, right? Mm -hmm. Until it becomes a very dubious line between... Uh, a, a genuine, of course, by the way, this, this isn't as if the prisoner is a murderer or a rapist. No. What would be the crime of this prisoner? Treason. The crime would be to not want the state to, to interfere in his or her private life. So automatically the charges are trumped up. But now you have the added pressure that, hey, there's some rich guy. And this needs to be said by the way as well, that mm. unfortunately it looks like a lot of the people that are coming in, a'udhu billah, but they're our own brothers and sisters. Now, not all, there does seem to be, you're the expert on this regard, but from what I read, there does seem to be an underground black market that is open to any bidder. But as you correctly point out, a good percentage, Allah knows how much, are coming from countries that are supposed to be bastions of Islam, you know, and a'udhu billah, one wonders, like, you know, it's What's just What's your so message sad. for those types of people then, Shaykh? Wallahi, akhi, a dignified death is infinitely better than what you think you're doing, a'udhu billah. To face Allah with a clean heart that malfunctioned, inshallah, shahada, for mm -hmm. you to go and purchase a heart, a'udhu billah, or to purchase a, it's, a it's kidney. It's theft, or a though, liver. isn't it? It's not even purchasing; it's stealing. It's, exactly. That's it's it's not even theft. It's like it's like fab, It's like you're hijacking the body. It's not even just a theft. It's like the government is using mm -hmm. you like a breeding animal. A'udhu billah. Can there be something more sinister than a government using human beings like guinea pigs and selling their organs to the highest bidder? So. I don't even understand how a Muslim can possibly... I mean, I, again, I've read the same... You are some, You have interviewed mm. people. I've only read on the news. I cannot imagine somebody walking in knowing... Because, you know, they're not even... They're going to China, you know? They know exactly what's going on. You can't even say... Bil Jahl. You can't even say... They're going to the uh, Turkestan province, East Turkestan province. They know exactly what is going on. And I, I just... I find it so difficult to understand that... How could you you know, uh, uh, give your own money. How could you go to another land that you know your Muslim brothers and sisters are doing this and then think that you're going to live a guilt-free, a conscience-free life and the quality of your life is going to be worth living? Mm. Billah. So it's, it's something that we need to point out that it's not for the first time that we find that the stab in the back is not coming from just an outsider. You know, we have to be clear here. What's happening in Yemen, what's happening to our scholars around the world, this is why so many of us become so cynical and bitter and frankly, this is why interpretations of Islam that are not mainstream, and I don't want to be too explicit, become acceptable and palatable because there's frustration. There's mm -hmm. an anger that 
there's just no hope. But you see, our religion is not based on emotionalism. And no matter how bad it gets, we have to say, قَالَ اللَّهُ قَالَ رَسُولُهُ And we have to stay within, uh, you know, the, the realms of the sharia. Allah musta'an. Allah musta'an. I mean, th- th- you really hit the nail on the head when you mentioned the word bureaucracy. It reminded me of Hannah Arendt when she was talking about, when she wrote mm-hmm. about the trial of Adolf Eichmann, going back to the Nazis. Uh, she, she called it the banality of evil. Yep, you know, exactly. These are people who are just civil servants. You're, you're expecting to find some monster there who's you know uh, frothing at the mouth, but you just find a, a highly efficient civil servant. But the machine is just geared towards you know this uh, this this oppression on on a, on a larger scale. So any time a genocide takes place in the world, any time something of this nature happens, the notion is that the people perpetrating it are not human anymore mm. but what we discover is that quite on the contrary they are you wouldn't be able to tell that they're monsters because what they've done is it's not as if they taken the humanity out of themselves listen to this they've taken the humanity out of their victims mm. what they've done is dehumanize their victims and by doing that they can go about as if they're living a normal life there was a picture that went viral last month about a bunch of Nazis walking out of the concentration camp, men and women flirting and having tea. And it went viral because you would never have thought that these are the guards at the concentration camp, right? But mm-hmm. now that they're outside, just like any young group of men and women, you know, going to the bar, doing whatever, you would never understand, like you said, the banality of evil. How could that happen? Because there were years and decades of indoctrination that these people are no longer people, which is what is happening in the you know Xinjiang province for the longest time. And unfortunately, it has begun in segments of Europe and other and other places in America mm-hmm. as well. Nowhere near. We're not even out of it like comparing. But I'm saying we in the West should learn that mm-hmm. these notions of assimilation, of integration of our values, this is a very dangerous talk that is headed towards a direction that is not palatable. And you see China on one end of the spectrum, but the brutal fact is the far rights in our countries are in the beginning of that spectrum, right? And yeah. if we allow the far rights to, to achieve their version you know, of, of society, this is a stepping stone to what we see in this uh, current regime uh, in China. Allah understand. Salam guys, me again, reminding you to head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to keep the lights on on Islam21c. We pride ourselves on being independent and being funded by the grassroots community. It's not even just the far right, I mean it's it's even kind of mainstream uh, liberalism. Um, the that MP is true. Saida Warsi, she said, um, you know, Islamophobia for example has passed the dinner table test like 10, 10 12 years ago, mm-hmm. i.e. that these... The, the the whole war and terror it's actually a broader discourse and the chinese are just um instrumentalizing that discourse to do these things on a mass scale whereas this exact same discourse is being used was was you know made by neocons around george bush for example tony blair was is is being implemented in china, in uh, france right now and even uh, i think today in 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 the uk the um uh the former home secretary sajid javid a brown personal muslim background is saying you know uh, France is right. This he even they even use the word separatism, Islamism, separatism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's the same continuum. It's just a kind of logical uh, conclusion of that. So um, we don't like to think about it, but there is always a possibility that you know um, things can move down that continuum. And unfortunately, it's not just non-Muslim regimes. It's even you know uh, we've seen. Uh, um, kind of quote unquote Muslim majority uh, or m- Muslim uh, states, you know, um, banning, for example, the uh, or, or using the word uh, terrorism and 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 uh, and so forth to describe Muslim uh, groups like uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and so forth. Uh, we've seen the the kind of unfortunate uh, kind of fatawa. I won't I won't press you on that too much too much if you don't want to talk about that. But there is that underlying premise that. Um, the problematizing of Muslims on the basis of not assimilating to what the state wants them to assimilate to. And yep. if we allow that to, you know. Mm-hmm. And Arsalan, you very correctly pointed out the misuse and abuse of the war on terror. Uh, this proved to be an, uh, uh, an amazingly Machiavellian moment for many regimes around the globe. Unfortunately, many of them are Muslim as well. To To use this argument that any uh, entity that is not in accordance with our version of society is essentially on the other side. You're either with us or against us, that type of rhetoric. And 
it's very true. You know, China jumped on the bandwagon. And unfortunately, you know, Salman, as you pointed out as well, a number of oil rich Muslim countries as well, they have also jumped on the bandwagon. And it's very clear that this discourse of the war on terror, it's it's being used in a very negative political manner. SubhanAllah, if we had only focused on, you know, actual people that are killing innocent civilians, the world would be a very different place. If we had focused on people that are just going into marketplaces and randomly killing people that don't deserve to die, I think, you know, 99.99% of the globe would be on one side and 0.001% would be the other side. But because of this, you know, the entire parameters have been uh, diluted. And that is why, see, here's the irony. The people on the other side, the neocons of the governments and regimes, they don't understand that this tactic is going to backfire. People like us are in the middle in the sense I do not support, you know, state terrorism and I don't support local terrorism either. I am against these NGO terrorist groups, not NGO, these subnational terrorist groups. And I'm also against, uh, you know, the regimes that are clamping down on human rights. We're trying to have that middle talk here. But by eliminating the validity of a middle and mm. by claiming you're either with us or against us, what people unfortunately then do is they then gravitate towards the extreme sides. So all of this rhetoric and all of these tactics are going to fuel a type of violence that is going to come back and harm all of us. And it's just an infinite cycle that I don't have any, there's no, as of yet, there's no glimmer at the end of the tunnel, even though theologically we believe everything's going to work out for the best. But mm -hmm. we don't see it right now, but we would, would yeah. put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. uh, Arsalan, let me ask you this. You you mentioned um, you know the, the history of the Uyghur people in that province, um, in that region. And I don't. I wouldn't blame them for obviously wanting. Uh, I think they completely deserve independence and so forth. But are there movements to overtly call for independence from the Chinese state? Is that what China is using as an excuse? Is that what the difference is between Uyghurs and other kind of Chinese groups that weren't didn't face the same level of oppression within China? Yeah. Uh, post post cultural revolution, no. Um, the, the thing is, if from day one, right, if from day one, if China had lived up to their promise of giving the Uyghurs an autonomous region, there wouldn't be an independence movement outside of East Turkestan. And, and many, some people may disagree with me, but the only reason now we see a lot of activists coming through is because of concentration camps. Yeah. It's not 2017 uh, where suddenly we, we had all this oppression. No, this oppression has been going for 70 years. But mm. it, it, it had to reach concentration camps for everyone to wake up and speak up. Um, because generally speaking, the vast majority of Uyghurs, um, basically the policies were, unless you were an outright protester or activist um, going against the Chinese regime, your family was fine unless you were doing that. But now you have people that have, you know, let's just say even if you were, if even if they were to use the, the excuse of Islam, where they practice mm -hmm. Islam, well, we have people going into these camps who don't even know what Bismillah means, like the mm -hmm. basics of Islam, or they don't even know how to do Salah. We have these people going into the camps. We have people that, people that um, are not, we have people that have even like assimilated, they've, they've worked for the Communist Party most of their life, on the verge of retirement, have already retired, deans of universities, singers, actors, comedians, like the elites of society who mm -hmm. have never stepped a foot wrong following the law. This is when Uyghurs as a whole realize that, you know what, independence is now far of, like it, it's been like, you know, like yeah. even if China were to back down now, no, because th this, as I mentioned before, softening, hardening, softening, hardening, like no way, like we, we need independence to survive. Yeah, it seems like a, I mean, a great uh, error on the part of, of of China to, yeah. you know, the more you oppress someone, the more you create that sentiment to, that to, that wants justice and retribution. Yeah, I, I mean, there are many, I'm sure that there are many peoples around the world who are living under a government, Canadians, Americans, Australians, mm -hmm. there are native people around the world. Sp uh, generally speaking, you don't see those people calling for independence because generally speaking, they're given their rights. So if they were right now, mm. um, just like, uh, 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 and um, we need independence to survive. So th that's why we need the call for independence. Um, we've always been independent, um, but yeah, 
it's it's either independence or literally death and and it's yeah. not just a clip that's so, literally uh, Arsalan, would you happen to know um the latest uh, percentage of uh actual uyghurs and han chinese in the province like i know around was it 50 years ago it was like almost 95 percent fully you know ethnically uyghurs or the people that used to live there for centuries so a very very small percentage of the han Yes. And I know in the last, as you said, 20 years, there's been a huge, you know, government plan. It's literally think of the Palestinians and mm. the European Jews that came in in the 1930s and exactly. 40s. Right? Think of that. Now that's happening. So what are the latest statistics in terms of uh, the, the, the broader population being just camped in by the authorities and, and put in? So according to the Chinese statistics, uh, the Han Chinese make up about 46, 47 percent. Of the, the population, yeah. Half the Uyghurs, of the population. yeah. The, the, the Uyghurs make up about half of the population, together with Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, and other tiny minorities. So it's literally 50-50, according to Chinese statistics. Uh, organi- organizations on the outside, we range our statistics anywhere between 20 mm-hmm. to 35 million Uyghurs. This is what we say. But it's very difficult to, to get census. But the Chinese are saying the Uyghurs themselves are around 11 to 12 million. And then the Chinese are also around 10 to 12 million. Now, so, get this. Okay. Get this. So okay. this is like the total population according to Communist Party statistics. Now, for the longest time, the UN has been saying over a million in the camps. US State Department has been saying two to three million in the camps. Uyghurs were guesstimating anywhere between 45 million in the camps. But six weeks ago, uh, uh, China's official white paper, they were, uh, they were boasting in their media saying that they had educated, educated, meaning they were in these camps, exactly what the Nazis said about the Jews, that they were mm-hmm. educating them. Mm-hmm. And you have the same sort of propaganda film, sewing and playing football and basketball. They said they had educated 1.3 million Uyghurs per year from 2014 to 2019. If you include 2020, that's 8 million. Now, if according to, if the Chinese statistics are correct about the Uyghur population, if there's 8 million in the camps or 8 million went through the system, what, the, the last 3 million, you, you got kids, you got older people and even kids. What's going to happen to all these kids when the parents are in the camps? They're also sent to boarding schools where they're in, indoctrinated, uh, you know, from a young age. Just like you send your kids to mad- madrasas teaching them Quran and fiqh, over there they're teaching them communism and to worship Xi Jinping and that your rizq does not come from the sky. Your rizq comes from working hard. This is what their children are taught, forced to um, speak Mandarin, uh, forced to give up their names, the, the Muslim names that, uh, that they were given. Mm-hmm. Um, and so statistics-wise... That's what's happening. And according to uh, one concentration camp detainee by the name of Mikhail Gultursun, during her stay, she witnessed, uh, she witnessed in a three-month period, nine people die, just in her cell. Now, according to Adrian Zenz, who is a scholar on this uh, issue, who's been researching, going through the Chinese, uh, going through open source, doing his research, and it has been accepted by uh, major universities and uh, you know, the US, Canada, UK, Australia, he estimates anywhere between 500 to 1,000 camps. And a lot of these camps are the size of football stadiums. So you can imagine in a recent article uh, written by the Radio Free Asia, they recently found at least two camps with crematoriums next to them. SubhanAllah. So Allah knows how many people have died. Right now, I have many friends still to this day. They have not been able. I have uh, one close friend. She she hasn't been able to contact her mother, her father, and her two brothers uh, for the past three years. And she has nothing to do with you know terrorism or extremism mm-hmm. or anything. I mean, just normal abiding citizens. Exactly. And you know, to, to understand how repressive this regime is, and Arslan, you are aware of this far better than any of us here, but you know, there are close friends of mine here in America, Uyghurs, uh, who are being extremely apolitical simply because of what's going on, right? And uh, even they are being harassed by the Chinese uh, consulates and embassies in America. I mean, yeah. imagine a friend of mine you know, got a call after he called his mother up and said, is everything okay? Or how are you doing? 
Okay, and the mother said, everything is fine. Don't worry, we're all fine. He got a call from the embassy telling him to come and visit the embassy. We want to talk to you, right? And he has dual citizenship, alhamdulillah. So he refused to do that. But can you imagine, mm. you know, the amount of pressure, every phone call is being monitored. After that phone call, he told me he was not able to get in touch with his mother for weeks. And now it's been years that mm. complete cutoff has happened. So people that are from this province, this ethnicity, our Muslim brothers and sisters, regardless of where they are in the world, I'm sure, Arsalan, you as your, you as well and your immediate family have had these indirect, you know, social pressure or media or maybe even more direct threats. So if they're doing this in Western lands, what do you think is happening, you know, over there? That gives us a kind of um, um, a glimpse into the fact that the Chinese state still actually cares about its its public image to some extent or not. I mean, the the Arsenal footballer, I forgot how to, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I Sorry, mean, I'm, I'm not I'm very... Mesut Ozil. Uh, mashallah, he you know took a stand. He was put, you know putting putting stuff out on social media and and using his platform to raise awareness about the plight of the Uyghur brothers and sisters. But the Chinese uh, state responded very uh, viciously. You know they they deleted him from the Chinese version of I think FIFA or something, the computer game. They del deleted his fan page and son Chinese social media and you know issuing all of these things. That so it does actually because I want to move on to some kind of practical you know, um, steps for us. And it so making a noise, it seems from an outsider's perspective, it does make some kind of impact. Is that correct, Masulan? Yes, definitely. Um, even during, you know, uh, as you mentioned, talk is Turkestan, we've been mm -hmm. uh, attacked by what you may have heard as the 50 cent social media army. They are literally paid by the government to troll and attack your page, bring down the rating, uh, censor you, um, shadow block you. So, uh, we had that and there is an article about this. Simply type in Talk East Turkestan and CNN wrote about this. Mm -hmm. So th th they got wind of it as well. Um, many other organizations have gone through the same thing. And as you mentioned, uh, we always say, uh, you know, we, we are making this noise. But to be honest, we want to be proven wrong. As the Sheikh mentioned, when he went into the region, he was followed and by the secret police and whatnot. Each time people do want to go. Uh, you, you know, for example, I always give the example of Iran. So, you know, for example, their nuclear program, they're like, all right, come in investigators, check us out so that they mm -hmm. don't get further sanctions by the US and other Western countries. China's not able to do this. No, in the, we want independent investigation. So China is not letting us in. Uh, every time um, a news outlet wants to go in and try and talk to the people or, you know, do something, they're always followed, they are harassed and their documentary, instead of trying to find out what's happening, their documentary, 95% of the time, ends up being about how they were followed most of the time. Mm. So make that noise, you know, uh, share that video, write that one comment. Um, you know, this is the most halal, legal thing that you could do. Another thing that I would give advice to my Muslim brothers and sisters, yani may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, protect and <laughs> all the Muslims around the world. However, right now, the Uyghur issue is the only issue in the world where the right, the left, atheists, I'm talking about atheists in the Western world, atheists, mm -hmm. Christians, Jews, uh, Muslims are able to come together on this issue. They're able to come yeah. together and yani, the common enemy is communist China. So, and uh, like, I, as we all know, I'm sure we've experienced some sort of censorship when we, you know, post something about Palestine against Israel or mm. we post something, you know, but with the Uyghur issue, your posts are going to be boosted. You're going to be supported. Um, on my show, I, I had former Trump advisors on my show. I've had national Tea Party movement people on my show. You would not believe mm. how people are coming together. Like, subhanAllah, like, if you want to do this is an, actually a safe way. You're not going to be targeted by yeah, the yeah. CIA or FBI for doing this. You're going to get so much more rewards. And the West, like I said, the West is supportive of this, subhanAllah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the main things in our favor as well is uh, the uh, the slogan, never again from the Holocaust, yeah. that we mm -hmm. really do need to um, uh, hold them up to their words. The world has said never again. You know, we have all agreed after the Holocaust that we're not going to turn a blind eye. 
Okay, that was what the I grew up with that type of rhetoric you know, throughout, throughout the 80s and 90s. That's what the, the impression that was given. And we thought it's never going to happen again. Now we say, okay, it's not to the level of actual death of 6 million people. But as you yourself said, it is one degree less than that. And if and when death were to begin, if we're doing nothing now, then we've already turned a blind eye. So I think we have a lot of things working in our favor. And inshallah, ta'ala, if we can all do our bit here. But really, the mm -hmm. question comes, Arsana, and I know it's a really awkward question. If you feel you don't want to answer it or you, it's up to you. But should we be boycotting specific products? I don't want to mention names. But should we be boycotting brands or dot, dot, dot that <laughs> is it going to actually have an impact? Or is that simply because here's my point. Muslims, unfortunately, don't seem to have many Muslims don't seem to have a systematic, coherent philosophy of boycotting. Mm. And they especially for the Zionists, for example, we all want to support a legitimate BDS, but mm -hmm. they bring in ludicrous brands, you know, Starbucks is Zionist and this is Zionist. And that's and we all know any intelligent person knows nothing's going to happen. You might have a better life and heart bigger budget if you don't buy starbucks but you know and it's definitely cheap coffee as well as another point but i mean nothing's going to happen to the palestinians if you buy or don't buy a lot of emotionalism comes in so my question to you arsalan is is there specific uh you know are there specific products and agencies that we should be able to boycott and if so what are they and if not then what's the alternative is there economic? a coordinated movement yes right now there is something called the Uyghur forced labor act um, and th th this is this is being passed in US law. So please, uh, um, American citizens, and I'm sure the UK uh, citizens can come up with something similar, where you can uh, talk to your representatives and try and get that passed. Because some of these brands, unfortunately, many people will not technically be able to live without. So we're talking Apple. And, th and, and many brands like this, mm. if Apple, they, they could literally move their, their factories, you know, to Bangladesh or, you know, Thailand or, you know, other countries. So, and Apple is lobbying against this bill, if you would believe. Yeah. So well. yes, boycott where you can. I mean, do your best. Um, uh, you, you know, we say boycott, but at the same time, uh, there is something better where if a law were to be passed, those countries would not be able to operate according to US law um, because there is some sort of slavery being involved. And so... If you want a win-win situation, have that uh, law pass so that your favorite, you'll still be able to use your favorite brands because those brands would be making their products in other countries. If not, then yes, boycotts do it. Look what happened in France. You know, uh, Macron had to sort of take a step back and say, you know what, you know, I'm not against Muslims, but uh, freedom of speech yeah. and la di da di da And so it does work. But, you know, France is not China. You know, um, our, our whole lives are dependent on China. Do your best because if we tell people to go to the extreme and boycott, one, they're not going to do it. It's going to be difficult. Do your bit. You know, there, yeah. there may be a toy that you're going to buy for, um, you know, or whatever festival you're celebrating. I mean, if you can do without buying you know, from China or buying that, you know, uh, that T-shirt or that pan pants, you know, do your bit slowly, slowly. So it's uh, many people will not be able to go cold turkey, but sooner or later, We'll get there. We always, we always look we for... Force Labor Act. You guys should look yeah. that up. Assalamualaikum guys. Last reminder, I promise. Head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to help this movement get to the next level. So we have genuine, high quality media articulating Islam in the 21st century and developing confident Muslims impacting the world for the better. We always look for like a quick fix solution, but it requires yeah. millions of people doing something small to sometimes make a exactly. huge change, you know. Um, so we'll we'll put some links to that in the description and get Arsalan yourself to write something as well for, you know, what exactly what we can do. I think boycotting Apple is cutting a bit too close to Sheikh Yasul Qadi's uh, and my own... Uh, you know, uh, sensitivities. If it needs to be done, it will be yeah. done. That's why yeah. I'm asking Arsalan. Again, I'm being Arsalan. brutally honest here, right? Yeah. If that's the sacrifice, then subhanAllah, yeah. what a first world sacrifice. Wallahi, yeah. what a first world <laughs> sacrifice to, to move from one operating yeah. system to another. And he, you know, it's not something we like to do, but if that's going to help, that's why I'm asking you that yeah. very blunt question and but, I appreciate uh, your answer, you know. It's yeah, a, but actually, Chef, it's actually all the operating systems. You would literally not be able to use any. Yeah. Uh, uh, unless you found like one from you know a startup from the Middle East or something, literally all Samsung, everyone's involved, Sheikh. Yeah. 
in that that's list what of I, was, I mean that's yeah. what i'm thinking because we need some kind of long longer term um, strategy because Muslim states are one of the things I wanted to ask you was you know what do Muslim states for example do and they're so in kind of uh, um, enthralled in the whole uh, Chinese system when it, whether it's Pakistan whether it's Turkey whether it's the Gulf states you know there, there's such a reliance on Chinese products that it's you know what what do Uyghur brothers and sisters I mean, so general brothers and sisters around the world, we can, we and we should give messages of support, support, um, you know, increase the the awareness of the plight and so forth, and and take part in these uh, boycott and and lobby our governments and MPs and so forth. But what do, what do Uyghur brothers and sisters want the states, Muslim states, to do? Uh, the Muslim states uh, to live by Islam. Like, for example, we have Uyghurs in Saudi Arabia about to be deported back to China. I mean, they could mm -hmm. easily not deport them. We had Uyghurs uh, deported from Egypt. Uh, we had Uyghurs deported from Turkey, you know, uh, a place where we have ethnic and um, ethnic and religious ties. Pakistan, mm -hmm. all over the, these Turkic states, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. Uh, that, that, uh, an argument that a lot of people who deny the Uyghur Holocaust, is, that, that's what I uh, call it, the Uyghur Holocaust, is that well, how come we don't see people leave, leave in the hundreds of thousands en masse like what's happening in Syria? Well, brother, where are they going to go? Because all, mm -hmm. all of the outside states, they're just going to catch them and give them back. But we did have thousands of Uyghurs go through the south of China into Malaysia and they got caught in, not, uh, they didn't, some of them made it to Malaysia and Indonesia, but a lot of them caught in, got caught in tight prisons. We still have some brothers and sisters there. A lot of them were taken by Turkey. Some went to other countries. So we did mm -hmm. have people fleeing. But not to the amount like Syria, because Syria, you have Turkey, you have Lebanon, you have all these other countries willing to take them and take care of them. And you go to Greece and all this. But Turkey is such a high tech surveillance uh, military state, mm. um, you know, second strongest state in the world. You're not going to have that movement. So, yeah. Sorry, I forgot the question, but. <laughs> in terms of, of so Muslim, Muslim states, your, your message. Yeah, yeah. yeah Muslim Muslim well, basically. Mm. Um, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us that uh, Muslims, you know, what we, the Ummah is one body. And, it's, and, and what we really need to live by that, um, put, pressure on, uh, put pressure on China, uh, you know, in those world forums, uh, the UN. Mm. Because we have, subhanAllah, like at the UN, we have a lot of non-Muslim countries, uh, Northern Europe, Australia, Canada, America, signing letters um, against China's oppression against the, the, the Uyghurs. But you have Muslim countries, North African countries, countries yeah. of the Gulf, uh, supporting. Uh, you, you know, uh, th there was a speech uh, around one year ago or one and a half years ago by Dr. Zakir Naik. He said, all right, yeah. one thing, you could be silent on the matter. All right. Mm. But now you're going to go ahead and sign letters supporting, you know, um, a, a regime like this. And so this is what we want. We want acknowledgement that, that there is oppression and to do something about it. I feel it must it must feel like betrayal from uh, from Muslim states, but unfortunately, a lot of Muslim states are built on betrayal, and it yeah. it seems to be a uh, you know not to just kind of bash for the sake of bashing, but it seems to be a, a a widespread issue. But there's also an issue of practically, um, if a Muslim state for whatever reason it's so dependent on China now. Um, like the ones in its vicinity or you know if China if Chinese regime would decide they could turn off electricity for example so we need we do need to think of a longer term strategy I think of strengthening the independence of Muslim states and the inter-cooperation among Muslim states so that eventually they can get to a level where they can have a develop a backbone and you know uh, uh, do these types of things because I think those statements about you know, coming out into support of China. I think that was just written by the Chinese and said, you know, hey, we want you to sign this. And if you have no uh, or actual genuine, you know, power or autonomy of your own, um, you, you have to just do as you're told, right, Sheikh? So again, I mean, I know time is almost up as well. I wanted to just put this in as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very important that we get angry at our own regimes and our own governments. It's very important. I'm never going to stop doing that. At the same time, Allah is not going to ask us about them. And we have mm. to be careful of using them as a punching bag 
that makes us feel good as we do nothing else other than punch the bag. Yeah. Unfortunately, all mm. too often, us Muslims, we just want to just vent out and we have every right to vent out and we should vent out on our own. And yes, that's legitimate, but it is one element of a much broader picture. And anyone who finds himself just venting and doing nothing else, frankly, has failed. Mm. That's not the goal. And, you know, if you read the seerah of the Prophet, one thing Sorry, that Sorry. really struck me, one thing that really, it just, it, it just empowers me every time. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. Anybody out there that's watching this, correct me if I'm wrong. I have not found a single instance, not one where the Prophet complained and groveled about treatment of others to him. Not once. And to me, thinking about that, it's because it exudes a dignity and a faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let people do what they want. I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Others did, the Sahaba, but the Prophet never once did he say, how can you do this to me? Not once, not to the people of Ta'if, not to the people of Mecca, his own kith and kin. He complained to Allah after Ta'if. He complained to the, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal on the Hijrah. The Quran came down. We know it hurts you, right? The Quran came down that you might even die of depression. Right? That it's just, it's meaning, uh, that's a very harsh word used, but the, the grief is overwhelming is mm. probably a better way to translate that, right? It's overwhelming grief that might cause, you know, a disaster or calamity. But he never once groveled in front of any other makhluk. And that is to show us, not that it's haram because how much does it have to do that? But to show us the paragon, to show us why he is Rasulullah says, and we are his followers, right? To, to raise the bar so high to indicate what is dignity. So it's very important we get our anger out to all of these people, mm. these sellouts, these scholars for dollars, these regimes, oil rich. Very important. Yes, get that done. Now, now that we've done that, right? Now let's move on to doing something that we can actually actually cause a change in our immediate circle and no our doubt sphere as of we, influence yes yeah. our sphere of influence do whatever we can facebook social media twitter whatever we can do our own family and friends soft pressure on our own governments to acknowledge this but you know at the end of the day he, here's the point my my concluding mm. message you know and, uh, and uh, you know feel free to have other questions but my concluding message is, is as follows we might not see the light at the end of the tunnel we might not see the uyghurs fully freed we might not see the Palestinians living in peace. We might not see the world achieve, you know, the complete yani, peace that we are promised under the end of times. You know, we're, we might not see that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us to see that. Mm. Allah created us to do whatever we can mm. so that when we meet him, we can say, oh Allah, this is what I did about the Uyghur situation. This is what I did about the Palestinians. This is what I did about the Syrian refugees. And if we're able to show something and the very least that we can show is a genuine concern in our hearts. The very least we can show is to raise our hands and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have a genuine sense of connection with every oppressed people around the world, every single uh, person, Muslim or Muslim, and frankly, even non-Muslim, anybody who is oppressed, there should be some sense of, hey, I wish that wasn't happening. I wish I could do something to help. And maybe in that genuine wish is our salvation. And maybe on the Day of Judgment, we'll have just a bit of excuse that, oh Allah, I couldn't help the Uyghurs, but I thought about them left and right. They were constantly in my du'as. I wish I could do more, but I spoke to them, to the people about them. I, you know, whatever little I could do. And perhaps in that is our salvation. And as we live our lives and we find these causes and we fight for them in whatever little way, inshallah ta'ala, our lives get a nobility of purpose and a higher meaning. And in doing that, we will gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not a optimism that is going to make us feel good in this world but inshallah it's an optimism that will make our life worth living and it's an optimism that we will see the effects of what we've done in the akhirah and if we see in this world then alhamdulillah because again how many of the sahaba mm -hmm. died before the conquest of mecca right mm -hmm. how many of them you know my own namesake yasir you know and his wife sumayya they didn't live to see the fruits of their sacrifice in this dunya but inshallah what they saw of the akhirah and then their names come down in legacy. Right. And that's really our goal, that Allah Azza wa will write down our names that we did whatever we could, and then we're going to meet the rewards in the, in the hereafter, inshallah. Zakallah khair, Sheikh. I mean, I'll just add that uh, there's no Muslim or anyone uh, living now watching this that is not able to do something. There's always, 
you know, even because everything that's that all the information that's uh, you know uh, shown to everyone in in this day of uh, social media and everything, it's all algorithmically controlled. So each and every person has the opportunity to help something, some important news go viral. Um, if we see some important news about the Uyghur situation uh, and we just scroll past it, that's giving a signal to those social media algorithms, for example, that that um, mediate what's shown on your timelines, what's shown in your news feeds. It's giving a signal that this isn't something important or engaging, so it will show it to fewer and fewer people. If we pause on that, if we spend a few seconds, we click the link, we read what's going on, we share it, we comment, etc., etc., we engage with that thing, it gives more and more signals to the algorithms to show that thing to more and more people. So every single one of us, we have the opportunity to help uh, important news go viral because naturally when we see something that that displeases us, we see something that's sad, we want to just kind of cognitive dissonance, right? We just want to block it out, we just want to ignore it and move on. Right, we want to minimize that little window or change the channel or whatever. So we have to fight this, and you know, do our part in the uh, uh, in the kind of this algorithmically controlled world. So I wanted to just round off by just just uh, consolidating a few of the practical things that you both have discussed. So um, obviously, keeping the 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 Uyghur issue in our minds and our hearts, making du'a for our brothers and sisters, um, messaging them via uh, people like yourself, Arsalan, giving support, uh, messages of support and, and moral kind of solidarity because we shouldn't underestimate the, 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 the power that moral support gives to brothers and sisters. You know, even Allah gave moral support to the Prophet, وسلم, you know, when he said, uh, uh, The Prophet, وسلم, Allah is praising him, you're not a madman, you know, you have the highest standard of character and so forth. Um, also, you know, um, um, look, you mentioned the Uyghur Forced Labour Act. To to yeah. check that out, uh, people in the UK, in, in particular, you can we can um, send messages of um, uh, messages to our foreign, com foreign and Commonwealth Office to issue a statement. Our local MPs, for example, uh, we'll put these things in an Islam Twenty Two article as well, inshallah, just to consolidate that. Um, uh, look for, look out for, subscribe to TET. Subscri look, look out for coordinated boycott campaigns. Uh, I saw something about the Winter Olympics, for example. Um, that could be a potentially big uh, campaign uh, that we're going to be, inshallah, helping if 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 uh, if that's uh, if that's still happening, if that's still going ahead. Um, the, you know, we were going to, we were organizing with uh, Sabur Ahmed from uh, IIRA. We were, there was going to be a protest in, in London outside the Chinese embassy, but it was um, postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but that will be going ahead, inshallah, soon when, when you know, when the lockdown is uh, lifted. And mm. uh, yeah, try and, try and uh, do our best to get the, get the, the get the word out. So, Zakna Khairan for joining us. Sheikh Yas, you gave your, uh, last words. Arsalan, what's your final message to the brothers and sisters watching? Um, I want to say even before, you know, uh, obviously dua and all those practical things, but another thing, brothers and sisters, and I'm sure Dr. Yasir Qadi will agree with me and other shiuch and other people that give Juma khutbas, is that brothers and sisters, we have a lot of brothers and sisters who will tune into Islamic channels like this, um, who don't pray, who don't practice Islam, but mashallah, they're still Muslims. And I just want to say, you guys are living freely in the Western world. You have freedom to pray. You have freedom to have your lihya, your hijab, to fast. And I say, please turn back to Islam because we have brothers and sisters in East Turkestan that want to pray, that want to fast, that want to give birth and name their children Muhammad. But on a daily basis, thousands of Muhammads are being aborted. Thousands of Muhammads are having their are having their organs harvested. Thousands of Fatimas and Aishas are having their organs harvested. So please turn back to Islam because you are free to practice your Islam. And Wallahi Azim, if the Uyghurs had the freedom that you had, SubhanAllah. So please be grateful for you what you have. You guys have a voice. And Allah will ask you what you did with that voice. And that's my final message. Zakna khair brothers. Uh, on that uh, uh, on that note, um, I'd like to thank you both again, Sheikh Yasser Qadi and uh, uh, brother Arsalan Hidayat. Um, check them out in the comments below and the in the description below. We'll put their uh, respective uh, talks and 
and uh, websites that talk about these things uh, in the description below, inshallah. And Zakum for for uh, to you all watching uh, at home today. Uh, if you um, enjoyed the uh, discussion, if you like the the podcast, please give a like and a share. Get involved in the comments and let us know uh, your thoughts on the matter. Please do try and share this news and all of the stuff that's going to be coming out about the Uyghur situation on Islam Tunisi and elsewhere. And until next time. Jazakum Allah khairan, I've been your host Salman Ban. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa